This is Update One, the podcast of the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Update One provides a forum for listeners to learn about national and international stories focusing on journalism and communication issues, news, and politics. Now, the latest edition of Update One. This is Lincoln Smith. We are joined today by Dr. Jonathan Ward, founder of Atlas Organization, a Washington, D.C. and New York-based consultancy firm focused on Chinese and Indian national strategy. Welcome, Dr. Jonathan Ward. How are you today? Good, thank you, Link. It's good to be here. Can you tell us a bit more about your story, uh, where you're from, education, and who you've studied with? Sure. So I grew up uh, in the Northeast in New England, and um, you know, basically early on in life, in my teens, I decided I wanted to learn the um, sort of most widely spoken languages in the world so that I could communicate with as many people as possible in the world and therefore understand what was going on, you know, in my lifetime and such. So I learned, um, you know, Russian, Chinese, Spanish, ultimately Arabic and others, and and spent about five years um, living out of a backpack in Russia, China, India, Latin America, and the Middle East. You know, I did Russian and Chinese language at Columbia as an undergrad, then finally wound up at Oxford um, doing a PhD in China-India relations, you know, studied with some of the world's greatest historians on those countries. And then came back to the United States where I began consulting for the U.S. Department of Defense and founded my own consultancy to advise large organizations on India and China. So I've been doing that ever since for the last few years since coming back to America. And indeed, you are the founder of Atlas Organization. It's a consultancy focused on Chinese and Indian national strategy. Can you elaborate a bit on what the mission of Atlas Organization is? So the mission and purpose of Atlas is basically, I mean, I realized that we're going to be at this massive historical turning point where, um, you know, India and China are going to reshape how the world works um, strategically, economically, militarily, all of that. And that's going to impact the trajectory of the United States of America. And we have to be prepared for this moment. So um, the mission of my company is, is basically at this point to focus with the business community, with finance and companies to help them understand how this is going to take shape and what they need to do to position for this. When it comes to China, I mean, we're going to wind up in, um, you know, we're already in it, the, the toughest contest we've had since the Cold War. I mean, this is a dangerous adversary state that we've spent decades engaging with economically, and now we're going to have to redo everything in that relationship. And then with India, we're going to need to come together with them as a partner nation um, and help rebuild the global democratic order. So this is going to change a lot for pretty much everybody. And, you know, what I wanted to do was be able to advise, you know, um, major organizations in the United States from government to, to companies to essentially everybody who will be impacted by this on the nature of those two countries, their goals, the way that they see it from, um, you know, from their historical perspective and their, you know, view of the future, because these, these countries are working actively to reshape, you know, a lot of different things. To your travel, uh, throughout Asia, Russia, Latin America, Middle East. Can you briefly touch on the primary challenges you believe are facing each of these regions today in 2020? Well, I think what you have is this much larger picture of the sort of international order that we had since the end of the Cold War with the United States as the dominant power beginning to, to come under great stress. So um, I think region by region across the world, the biggest issue is the fact that China is going global with its influence. You know, it's certainly built up the economic relationships all across the planet at this point. It's building a military that's meant to, um, you know, sort of project power ultimately globally, but already in different regions um, from, you know, the Indian Ocean region to the West Pacific. Um, and, you know, each of these these countries and regions is going to, you know, find its sort of fate within the broader U.S.-China competition. So we are going to need to work within our alliance system and bring the allies closer together around this issue of the problem of China. And at the same time, China is going to be waging a counter contest to move places like Russia closer to it. They already have a deepening partnership uh, to move Latin America closer through economic and diplomatic relationships. Uh, Middle East, same goes there. I mean, that's a major resource base for China. So we're waging a global contest. I mean, we have to look at China as a global actor. 
And America is going to have to have very sophisticated regional strategies for each of these places so that we can essentially bring the world back together in a way that um, continues to lead to, um, you know, sort of guarantee our leadership. I mean, we need that. We need to ensure that, um, you know, this decade and this century are still, um, you know, in in the hands of of free countries and not in the hands of of China's vision. And indeed, you've studied China's rise for over a decade over to U.S.-China relations, what do you believe is the greatest challenge amidst your thoughts that are facing or is facing U.S.-China relations both now and in the future? Can you pick one? I mean, there are all kinds of challenges, but I think the the biggest challenge is for America to realize that this relationship with China is not what we wanted it to be and that it's okay for us to let go of our expectations. Um, You know, we spent uh, 25, 30 years trying to bring them into the world order, hoping that they would become a partner to us. Some called it responsible stakeholder. That has not happened. Instead, what we've done is through engagement with China, we've empowered them. We've built up their their industrial capacity, their strategic capacities, you know, their military capacity, um, you know, indirectly, their technological capacity directly. And I don't believe that the U.S.-China relationship is the most important relationship. I think the most important relationship for the United States is with everybody else so that we can come up with a a way to to solve this issue and ensure that China does not realize its ambitions. So our biggest challenge is going to be in rethinking this relationship and positioning ourselves strategically to win this contest. I mean, they're just busy trying to, um, you know, get the outcome that they're they're looking for, which is dominance. To your thought about improving the United States relationship with everybody else in an effort to uh, deal with China, uh, what would be the top one or two uh, actions that you would take uh, writ large to improve those relationships? Economic engagement. Um, We're going to need an economic grand strategy. I think that the luxury that America has had for, you know, since the Second World War, is that we were such a giant portion of global domestic product. I mean, we were such a big piece of, of the world economy that we could resource a global strategy and basically secure uh, a world that was, um, you know, predominantly led and by, by free nations. I mean, our alliance system shows this and the, the sort of progression of democracy until very recently shows this. I mean, we, we were able to build and influence a world in our image and, and all the sort of ideals that that we hold dear. And we have to remember that that comes from economic power. So we need an economic strategy. And I would break this into two pieces. We need an economic strategy for um, industrial, um, as as some say, developed nations from the OECD, from Europe to Japan to Australia to Canada. And then we need um, an economic strategy for the developing nations, for all the emerging nations, you know, from India to Africa to Latin America and the Middle East. And we need to know how to engage, know how to succeed in, in, in commerce, um, in investment, in sort of um, all of these trade flows. I mean, we have to bring this back to a game that we win. China surpassed us in terms of total trade um, in 2013. And they're, and they're basically the top trading partner for numerous nations around the world. We have to get back to a place where we are the main game in town when it comes to economic relations. Um, And we're going to need to be very smart about how to do that region by region, nation by nation across the earth. And I think if we can do that in the next decade, in the 2020s, then we're going to be on on the right footing for the rest of the century. If we fail to do that, we will see that China succeeds more quickly than we ever expected. So that is number one, two, and three for the economic power. Over to the media, what do you believe is the state of press freedom? And let's pick China and Hong Kong. We're having this conversation in a very uh, tragic and disturbing week um, where China has enacted its national security law. It's made its first arrests in Hong Kong. And you basically really have seen the death now of all kinds of freedoms that have existed in Hong Kong for a long time. So that's over. Hong Kong as a great world city, as a, as a you know, a city of, of freedom that is now finished. And when we talk about press freedom, I'm going to read you something from my book, China's Vision of Victory, which has been very widely sure. read, um, especially in national security and government. And, you know, it's all built on primary sources. I mean, that's what I spent the last, you know, a lot of my time doing all, many years 
understanding their point of view in their own words, the Communist Party. But here's something that tells you a little bit about how they see the press. Um, this is Xi Jinping uh, speaking to, to, to a press corps in China. He says, the media run by the party and the government are the propaganda fronts and must have the party as their family name. All the work by the party's media must reflect the party's will, safeguard the party's authority, and safeguard the party's unity. They must love the party, protect the party, and closely align themselves with the party leadership in thought, politics, and action. So it's totalitarian. It's a totalitarian vision. Um, you know, one great scholar um, from my generation, sort of a, a rising star, made the very important point that when we talk about things like the social credit score in China, um, it's only recently that the technology has caught up with the actual philosophical vision of the Communist Party of China. And what that is, this idea of social control, that you control society as though it were a machine and you force it into a shared thought and action to achieve your strategic goals. It's a very scary thing. I write about it in the book and pull all of this together. But it's very important that we are going to lose, I think, the quality of information that we've had from China based on the openness that there's been for the last 25 years. We're going to lose that over time as they kick out foreign you know, journalists and, and crack down on all of this. So understanding China will become in its own right, a very interesting subject now because it's going to be harder and harder to, to know the ground truth. There are millions that live in Hong Kong and they've known freedom. Do you see the Communist Chinese Party being successful in taking their freedom away? Well, yes. I mean, I, th I think that that's what this law is about. It's the ability to extradite and, and try um, you know, anyone who they deem to be subversive or, or uh, undermining state security, which essentially means anything that they wish that to mean. Um, and they can try them now in the mainland, which um, means that the kind of activities you see, I mean, the protests, I remember, when, you know, I've been to Hong Kong many, many times um, throughout my time in Asia. And I, I remember arriving there um, in 2006. And, you know, I just come out of the mainland China. And, you know, I, I arrived in the uh, Victoria area and down by the bay, and, and, you know, there are all these signs that have Falun Gong, and it says Auschwitz in China, and it shows all the organ harvesting and, and just the torture of Falun Gong prisoners. And I was just astonished, because you'd never see that in China, ever, obviously. And, and you know, I'd been a young traveler going all over that country, and just, it, it was so jarring in the contrast to what the mainland was like. And then, you know, a, a few years later, I was back in, in, in Hong Kong, and those signs were all gone. And instead, they had signs for, you know, a maybe a mile radius that said Falun Gong is an evil cult. Rid our, our, you know, society of the Falun Gong. And I realized, wow, this is the beginning of Hong Kong changing. What used to be um, a place for for a totally different, um, you know, facts and, and real information is now uh, being suppressed by the party. And of course, today, they, so they have gradually been doing this. But the national security law is really the um, the nail in the coffin. And the Hong Kong protesters have been, I think, um, you know, the bravest people in the world today uh, for what they've gone through um, to stand up to the party. But but this law is really, um, you know, that's that's the final moment. And I think it's now important. I, I agree that the idea that the democracies around the world will take in Hong Kongers, um, that is very important. We have to do that. And when you say taking in, you mean literally traveling from Hong Kong or supporting them in other ways? I think um, they, they need a, an escape route. And that should be to the world's free countries. And with the recent unrest in Hong Kong, what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, in sum, what do you believe the overall political, economic, and social future of Hong Kong to be? I think there, there are two dimensions to it. On one hand, the laws that, that have been enacted are, are essentially, as some say, it's now just another city in China. Um, that may be true. I mean, people go to Shanghai and they you know, get Starbucks and pretty similar to, to many global cities. But, but the difference is really that it's been a space for protest against the Communist Party for so long that now the party is going to be cracking down on that. So you know, we don't see the news of how the party cracks down on people in the mainland. I mean, we don't get to see that, um, but we have had a window into that through Hong Kong. But, you know, they are going to be um, 
ending all of that, I, I, I suppose, over time through these new laws and actions and the and the security apparatuses that are permitted now to operate there. And then there's the question of also what does that mean economically? I mean, is this, you know, Hong Kong for quite a long time has been a, a gateway to for, for, for capital to flow into China. And, you know, I think one of the most important things here is that we begin to cut off capital to the Communist Party of China and to the People's Republic of China. So, you know, Hong Kong certainly provokes that situation and, and accelerates that. I mean, we should not be funding a, a, a military industrial state that is, you know, in, in territorial conflict with all of its neighbors and, and with us. So policymakers, I think, are already doing this. They're looking at ways to, to um, you know, shut down some of that, some of China's access to capital. But Hong Kong has, has always been important for them economically, and, and, and we're going to have to ensure that it's not because they have violated all the rules. We can't give them that free pass. Over to the China-India border crisis, what do you believe is the root cause of the border crisis, and what do you believe the future holds for China-India relations writ large? Right. So this was actually the subject of my PhD at Oxford. I, I worked on, um, you know, the, the China-India relationship, you know, from the founding of the two countries as modern states, I mean, from Indian independence and the founding of the People's Republic of China up to the border war in 1962. So they fought a war in 1962 in the Himalayas, which not many people know a whole lot about. But what it really was about was China saw India as this rival, as this competitor that they had to essentially, as they said, teach a lesson to. And that war was a big turning point in, um, I think, the history of Asia. And most people miss that because it's very subtle and it's very, I think, outside of many people's radar screens. But what you're talking about is the relationship between the world's two largest nations in population being um, a very frosty relationship with a very troubled past. And what it was, was the two came together and basically said, we're going to be friends. We've been brothers for a thousand years. And they had this very sort of, um, you know, beautiful diplomacy. I mean, it was about, you know, decolonization. I mean, just all the flourishing of Asia um, after the European colonies were, were rolling back around the world. And, and you know, Nehru in India and Zhou Enlai in China basically said, look, we're going to be partners in this. And then they wound up at war. So a fascinating story. But it changed the course, I think, of Asian history because instead of a friendship or a partnership or even, you know, a sort of mutual um, sort of uh, sustainable coexistence between the two, it set this foundation that I think has just been triggered again. And what that is is that now you have, because of these clashes in the Himalayas, I think another turning point in China-India relations where the Indians would, would look at this and say, you know, we've given you not one, but two chances now. So we now understand that you are an enemy. And there was, I think, a normalization of relations over the decades since the border war. And there have been attempts to normalize and establish good diplomatic protocols in the last, you know, decade and under Modi and Xi. Even. Um, but that's gone now. That's over. So, so you're talking about a 21st century in which you have a broken relationship between the world's two most populous nations. And, and that's going to be very important to everything that comes next. In closing, Jonathan, you recently authored the book, China's Vision of Victory. And in the book, you discuss what China desires, how China will obtain what it wants, and what the United States should do in response. Can you just take a couple of minutes to highlight what you believe China wants, the how, and what U.S. response should be? So what China wants in short, and this is a vision that's largely constructed by the Communist Party of China. I mean, it's this idea um, that's been propagated and sort of nurtured for the last 70 years of the rule of the Communist Party. It's something called national rejuvenation and national resurrection. And the idea is that China was humiliated at the hands of the world in you know, a prior century, they call it the century of national humiliation. And then they stood up again under Mao Zedong, and now they will take their place um, at the head of all nations and become the dominant force. And on one hand, it's very ideological, but it's also incredibly strategic, disciplined, systematic, and, and, and operational. Um, they have strategies such as the Belt and Road, which are meant to link the entire um, Eurasian, African, 
um, in a super continental cluster back to China, with China as the economic center. Um, they have a strategy called Made in China 2025, which many have heard about, that seeks dominance in all of the strategic industries from robotics to aerospace, to you name it. And they're executing all of this and they're working towards this and they expect themselves to become the dominant power within essentially this generation. So that's what we're doing. And when we went out, and I think no country, and we have to remember this, no country has been a better friend to China than the United States. We have done so much um, you know, to engage them in the world, to invite them into all of the international institutions from the WTO to you name it. We've traded with them, we've empowered them, we've brought them technology, capital, everything, in the hopes that they would become a friend to us. And instead what this party has done is they've used all of that to empower their ultimate vision. And their vision is to become the dominant power in the world. And that they see is a world restored, one where they are at the center. And what we have to do is realize that it's time to reject that and to defeat that vision. We cannot accept it. America cannot accept that outcome and the world cannot accept that outcome. This is a totalitarian state. It killed 50 million people in the 20th century in service of those goals of national resurrection. And today it threatens its neighbor. And it is, you know, even in the Himalayas, it's, you've now seen the first use of the Chinese military against a, another state um, in the 21st century. So we're dealing with a very dangerous force and it's going to take the best minds among us to figure out how to defuse that problem and ensure that it does not become the fate of humanity. You know, I think it's an honor to speak to the National Press Corps because it's going to take, you know, brilliant journalists with a very deep and broad view to help us understand not just the news and the events, but the bigger picture that's unfolding here. I mean, those who will narrate the course of this moment in history, I think, will go down. Um, in the record books for for quite some time. So we have a giant, giant situation on our hands. We need to understand it fully and act accordingly. And you know, the United States is very well positioned, I think, to prevail in this case. But we will have to focus and understand it in full. Dr. Jonathan Ward, author of China's Vision of Victory and founder of the Atlas Organization. Thank you for joining us on the National Press Club Update 1 podcast. Thank you, Link. Update One is a production of the National Press Club's Broadcast Podcast Committee. You can comment on this podcast or any episode of Update One by sending an email to Update One Podcast. That's update the number one podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to Update One. Update One.